So now comes the exciting part, the baby, right? Uh, when I ask you guys for that in-class activity, are you planning to have children? See, the, it was very telling. Many people started talking about babies. And I think that actually is, um, uh, is something that I would like to emphasize. Because children are more than babies. So when we think about having children, some parents think a baby is cute. A baby is cute, that is inarguable. But babies grow up. They become you, individuals like you. Yes? And sometime in that process, you know, they become seven-year-olds, they become 10-year-olds, they become very ugly 12-year-olds, and then they blossom into very sullen adolescents. So becoming a father or a mother is not just becoming a parent to a baby. It is becoming a parent to someone who's going to go through all of those stages. And you should mentally prepare yourself for meeting head-on the challenges of every different stage. So we are at the cute stage here, uh, the baby. Uh, and we're going to look at early learning, motor skills, and perceptual capacities. So we are going to talk about what is the baby born with? What do we come to this world? What do we bring into this world as human beings that we use to build other cognitive, emotional, or social abilities on? What are the foundations? What is, what is at the start? And so this actually has been a topic of much debate in the past 30 years especially. And we have developed many ways of investigating what infants know. Uh, and there are both behavioral measures and there are also neuroimaging techniques that we can use now that tell us more about the babies. Because our job is very difficult. The baby is unable to tell us what they are feeling, what they are thinking, there is no language, they cry or smile. And these, this is very limited output for us to interpret. And we're going to see that researchers have used the looking behavior of babies to their advantage in trying to figure out what the baby knows or what the baby recognizes. So what is the baby experiencing? Is the baby experiencing a booming, buzzing confusion, or is it just more than that? So if you're imagining a baby just born, what capacities do you think the baby has, right? Does the baby know shapes? Does the baby know humans from inanimate objects? Does the baby understand causal relationships between actions? Does the baby know that if I drop this, it is going to fall? Does the baby expect that if I drop this, it is going to make a sound? Does the baby know that when you smile, you want to smile back? Right? So what does the baby know? So that has been a topic of uh, much debate. And if they don't know, how do they learn? So they, they have no language, right? I mean, imagine yourself as an adult. All of a sudden, I had this device here, and I transported you to Russia. Does anybody speak Russian here? Oh, you do. Yes. It's not you. you we don't transport you. We transport uh, your friend sitting next to you, which I think is Mohammed. Yes. We transport Mohammed. Mohammed wakes up and finds himself in the middle of Moscow. No language, right? No Russian. And so how is it that, how are you going to learn Russian? We, we left you there for some reason. <laughs> how are you going to learn a language from scratch? Right? And, how, and we know that children do this much easier than adults do. Why? What is it that as adults we have lost that they have? Right? So we're going to talk about all of these very exciting things. Uh, and so I'm, is, was there a question? No, OK. We're, so this is 50 minutes. We're, not going, we're going to watch the 50 minutes interspersed. I just want the te, uh, first 10, 11 minutes right now. And then we're going to start uh, talking about it in the next lecture, which is going to be shorter, obviously, after the break. We will watch portions of this uh, documentary uh, throughout this chapter. So 
uh, you're going to get an overload, overdose of cuteness. So we're at chapter four, and we are now at infancy, early learning, motor skills and perceptual capacities. We talked about what the debates were. We talked about the research questions. These questions are actually very interesting for even those people who are not interested in developmental psychology. It gives us clues about human functioning. It gives us clues about what makes humans special uh, and um, is very interesting. So newborn reflexes, the, the babies are born with reflexes and it's a sign of health that they show these reflexes. Uh, stuff like eye blink, for example, which we still have, right? If somebody were to bring something very close to your eye, all of a sudden you blink, right? For example, is a reflex. Rooting, right? When you caress the cheek of the baby, the baby turns its head and try to tries to mouth the finger. Sucking, swimming, this, this very early primitive form of swimming. Um, the moro reflex, uh, which is when the baby is being dropped, the baby goes like this, for example, right? Uh, the Palmer grasp, the tonic neck, the stepping, Babinski, all of these are reflexes that are in the child. And there's a very nice graph on your book, the table 4.1. I put it right over here. Do check it out also. Uh, now, why are reflexes important? Well, they have survival value, obviously, right? And that's why we inherit these reflexes. And it gives us a good idea about infants' neurological health. But do refle are reflexes here to stay? Most of them disappear. Why? Because they are replaced by gradual, voluntary action. <laughs> Imagine every time your friend went like this, you turned your head and tried to suck that finger. That is not, <laughs> that, that is not something you want to do. So obviously, uh, the reflexes are, provide survival value and are helpful for the infant. But the goal is for the baby to uh, gain voluntary control over these. Um, and so, for example, rooting disappears around three months, sucking around four months. <coughs> Uh, stepping around two months and tonic neck around four months. Why does stepping disappear? Is that what you're going to ask? Huh. What are you going to ask? Can you say reflexes disappear or should we say they change and improve and uh, make our actions? What is the definition of a reflex? It's an involuntary reaction. If, if that's the definition, then they disappear because they no longer are involuntary. Right? An action becomes voluntary. Yes. Well, tonic neck is, uh, again, um, it's basically the infant's, um, it's the impulse to basically uh, straighten the neck if the neck is going back. Yes. We will talk about that. We will talk about vision, we will talk about touch, they're coming, but I am so excited that you actually are excited about this. <laughs> yes. So you said that tonic neck is, you know, mm -hmm. straightening the neck, mm -hmm. but we hold the baby's head when we hold that. So if this has a survival value, why do we not collect it? But it's just in, involuntary. They can't hold it up. It's not like they can maintain that position forever. <laughs> yes, their muscles are not strong enough. The stepping also seems to disappear, but the thing is, the baby gets heavier. So it is harder also. So when you put them in water, the stepping sometimes comes back. So the stepping kind of disappears uh, out of the water because the infant is finding it hard to then coordinate, and the weight is also an issue. But underwater, you can see the stepping reflex again. So it's kind of interesting. <coughs> okay. Now, infant states of arousal, as any new parent can tell you, and we can ask Emre Bey and he can tell us, that their nights are no longer um, peaceful, long bouts <laughs> of sleep, right? And this is actually uh, very important for the, <laughs> for the parent to cope with, because imagine that you, know, uh, you are woken up every other hour, 
Uh, if you're a woman, you're woken up and you might have to nurse the infant, right? If you're a man, you're just trying to help your husband, uh, your wife. Uh, and so the, these, though, states of arousal are regulated um, gradually. Uh, infants uh, spend eight to nine hours uh, in regular sleep uh, and eight to nine hours in irregular REM sleep. Right? In regular sleep, their breathing is normal, they're evenly breathing, their eyes are closed, they look peaceful. In REM sleep, as you know, uh, the eyes are moving behind closed lids and there's intense electrical brain activity that is happening too. We usually associate dreaming with the REM state. Uh, and um, there is a lot of research that points to how REM sleep actually helps our brain to retain the information that we have learned before going to sleep, for example. So it's very useful. And it's very interesting that infants are spending this long a time in REM sleep. Uh, drowsiness, it w where, where varies. This is like not fully awake, not sleeping either. Uh, there's quite alertness, which all parents want it to be like 10 hours a day, but it's only two to three hours total. And these are not like two hours. Like it's like 10 minutes here, five minutes there. It adds up to two to three hours where the infant is just like, it's the, in that state where you want to like just cuddle the infant and you know, kiss the infant until the infant screams no. Uh, and then there's waking activity and crying for one to four hours a day, right? And it, crying is a very, very a potent stimulator for all uh, adults. When you hear a baby cry, you want to do something about it. Uh, and so, as you can see, then uh, we can imagine the life of a new parent, uh, not getting enough sleep, getting intermittent sleep, and having a baby that cries about four, one to four hours a day. Infants show a lot of variability. Just because your brother or your sister cried for seven hours or didn't cry much doesn't mean that they were abnormal or anything. It is just that, again, we are talking about averages here. Yes? I don't know how you can stop the baby from crying. Overstimulating the baby. Yes, you can overstimulate a baby. So mothers who are attuned to, and mothers and also uh, fathers, um, who are attuned to their baby, kind of learn through time. I mean, they don't know as soon as the baby arrives. It's a getting to know one another process for both the baby and the parents. But they soon learn to recognize signs of understimulation, overstimulation, need for food, need for sleep, uh, and so uh, they become better at it. And there are mothers who are not attuned. They're a, very they're a minority, and it can happen also in cases of depression. We're going to talk about depression, especially postpartum depression, where mother's reactions to the baby are not in agreement or concordant with the needs that the baby is showing. Uh, and so that, yes, can actually become a problematic for the baby too. You can, let me just say one more thing. I, I'm, I see three hands, I'll take all three of you. Uh, what sometimes does happen to, though, is that sometimes parents don't let the child sleep. And you might wonder how. Now, babies, when you go put them in uh, to their cribs, they say doze off and sleep. In their sleep, sometimes they wake up for a tiny periods of time and if not touched, they can go back to sleep, right? But sometimes new parents are so um, attentive, uh, over-attentive, that as soon as the baby makes a sound, now we have those like speakers, they rush and pick the baby up. But if they didn't, the baby can actually go back to sleep. So sometimes parents can overdo this attending behavior such that then sleep regulation becomes a problem. So it's important to let the infant, to see if the infant will fall back asleep. And this is not when the baby's crying full out. They're just murmuring, making sounds, you know, kicking a little bit. 
what is advised is that the parent, of course, goes, watches, and sees whether the baby is going to fall asleep on their own or not. And if not, of course, you know, it would be nice to pick the baby up and suit the baby. Uh, but if the baby's falling back asleep, fine, right? Okay, so three hands. Ipek. Uh, do babies know that it is one? No. So do they experience night terror or do they see night No. Night terrors are something that requires <laughs> cognitive achievement. It is actually the result of a cognitive achievement. Uh, night terrors don't uh, regularly happen in infants. And infants don't come to this world knowing what's day and what's night. If they did, half of Emrebe's problem would have been solved. <laughs> they actually become accustomed to the circadian rhythm through the parents going to sleep at a certain time, through parents putting the baby to sleep. And it takes about at least six months for them to get into something that resembles a circadian rhythm. Yes? Uh, the same question. Yeah, I was going to ask for if, they, if they can have a dream or nightmare. They could be dreaming, but a nightmare, uh, I mean, they could have unpleasant dreams, but if we, when we think about a nightmare, we're thinking about a scary dream with images and stuff that actually happens <laughs> later. These are around two years of age, you start getting night terrors. You see the imagination also has to develop, right? Now we're taking um, for granted the ability that you can imagine things. Like you can imagine what you're going to eat at lunch. 25 minutes. <laughs> Some of you will rush to the emekane and find a very, very long line for chicken. <laughs> yes. Now that, your ability to imagine that is actually an achievement. Your ability to situate yourself in time. To go back to yesterday, for example, what you had for breakfast. Last night, what you, watch, what you watched on your computer? Uh, what were you streaming last night? All of that is actually a cognitive achievement of yourself, being able to develop an understanding of self as separate from others and as situated in time. And that the baby doesn't have yet. Do I have another question? Yes, Rifia. Usually by six months, you, s you see the baby getting into some kind of circadian rhythm. However, waking up at night will still continue, possibly into 12 months. And it can go on a little longer, too. There is huge variability. But we, we know for sure, at least, again, uh, I have many friends who are developmental psychologists like myself. Uh, many of them have become parents. The thing that they do most is most religiously, is sleep times. So if, for example, that night you're going out, and every night you put your baby to bed at 7, but that night you're going to put the baby to bed at 11, that is a <laughs> that, that, it's not worth it. Uh, it is very important that you set a very regular structure for the kid, because the, the kids who get good sleep, are actually more alert, more ready to learn, interact more with their environment. There are studies that are done for that. They cry less. So uh, a, a way to get the crying under control is also uh, setting a nice, nice sleep pattern for the kid. This is easier said than done. Uh, yes? Well, I mean, as regular as possible, but uh, the nighttime sleep and the daytime, yeah, of course, daytime and nighttime sleeps aren't very different for the child who is not yet accustomed. So it is important that you understand the signs of sleepiness and the, or the mother, and they basically respond appropriately to it. My cousin has a baby smoothly in the night. Well, that is not a problem. Your cousin is trying to force the baby into circadian rhythm. Some might think it is too early, but others disagree. There isn't agreement on this. Uh, many mothers will experiment with their children, and we, they will find out. I mean, if, I'm sure that your cousin will see if the baby's head is dropping, she will let the baby sl sleep. But if a little stimulation can help the baby stay awake and alert and will help the baby sleep longer at night, probably your cousin is going to be proven right, right? So, every, so don't forget, every, 
Every child is different. There's a lot of variability. So there is no prescription, no recheta, really. And to understand, and every mother and father, within certain obvious limits, and not uh, in limits are not harming the child, will experiment and find what works for themselves and the child. Okay, sleep patterns, ooh, between birth and two years, sleep and wakefulness change. Sleep needs decline from 18 to 12 hours a day by age two. Still day naps are, that's why, necessary uh, for young children. Sleep-wake patterns begin conforming to a circadian rhythm. Uh, and arousal patterns are affected by both, look, brain development, but also cultural practices. And in cultural practices, we have co-sleeping versus sleeping in your own, in the baby's own room. Now, what happens usually, so, well, let me see hands. So of the babies that you know, do you know anyone who does co-sleeping, meaning the baby and the parents sleep in the same room? It's very prevalent, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this is a bad friend, I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, but uh, of these mothers, have they bought furniture for the baby and made a baby a nursery too? Did they? Yes. What do you do? You run to IKEA, you run to Stellar, you run to wherever furniture is being sold, and also buy a really nice set for the baby. Now, there is no right or wrong when it comes to co-sleeping. It changes from culture to culture. Many Eastern cultures, like Far Eastern cultures, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, Central Asian, actually practice co-sleeping. In you know, it's, it's individual sleeping, sleeping in the child's own bedroom, is kind of a practice uh, of North Americans. Uh, and uh, it works if the culture accepts it and works on it. Um, so um, there are individual differences, but babies seem to cry a little bit less when they're sleeping with the parents. Uh, it is easier for the mother to feed the baby. Uh, they're actually uh, apparatus that you know, cling on to the side of the bed on the mother's side, for example, where the baby's not in the same bed but is in an attached crib, if you will. So it's easier for the mother to take the baby, feed the baby, and put the baby back to sleep. One concern, obviously, is not to sleep on top of the baby. Uh, no, I mean, that can be dangerous. The babies should not have, and we have this practice in our culture too, like you shouldn't overstuff the crib, right? Uh, there shouldn't be like too many blankets, teddy bears, bunnies, because the infants can suffocate. Uh, and so with young infants who are not very mobile, who can't, for example, turn themselves and stuff, uh, it is very important that their uh, sleeping area is not cluttered. The, s the mattress is not too soft because the baby can just you know, sink into the mat mattress and not be able to turn. For those reasons, uh, usually they have those, as I said, crib apparatus that cling on to the side. So they're not really in the same bed, but they're attached. And so it seems to work for many. Um, and um, yes, uh, North America, yes, we talked about this. We talked about this. Yes. Studies show no differences in dependency. So one big fear of parents that if I let the kid sleep in my own bed, then my kid is going to be overly dependent on me. Studies aren't really showing this, but at one point in time, you probably will want to separate, and that is going to be uh, a task that you, it's just like potty training, you know, it is, it is a task, uh, and you need to be systematic in your efforts to make the child sleep in their bedroom whenever you feel it is the right time for them. Okay, These are, this is a very nice graph cho showing the changes in childhood sleep patterns. And as you see, this 90% REM sleep keeps decreasing and comes to uh, similar to adult patterns by five to nine years of age. And thank God, this purple thing is basically um, state um, being awake. So it increases as uh, the baby turns into uh, a toddler than a young child. Sudden infant death syndrome, have you ever heard of this before? 
So this is, um, it's a very sad thing. It is basically um, seemingly healthy babies uh, being put down to sleep by their parents. And then parents wake up and find the baby dead in their crib. Um, and um, uh, this, uh, and it, it is um, diagnosed as sudden infant death syndrome when an aut autopsy reveals no, nothing that can explain the death. Um, so this peaks between two and four months of age. Uh, and it's the leading cause of infant mortality in industrialized nations. Um, now, uh, there, are, there are certain factors that, can, that are correlated with it. Uh, smoking is one. Either uh, parental smoking, smoking in the house, for example, is a factor. Um, drug abuse is another factor. Uh, also, the infant sleep position. See, this poster uh, basically says, back to sleep. And it's a play on words, it's saying, put your infant on his or her back to sleep, not face forward. And when so there's a, also some parents like to put the infant on uh, his or her tummy because they want that nice round head in our culture. Have you ever heard of it? So that the, the, the back of the head won't be flat. Uh, but it is not worth it. Uh, the infant may not be able to realize that they're breathing the same uh, air that they're giving out and getting more and more carbo um, carbon dioxide as they inhale, for example, and may die that way, or may not be able to turn themselves. And so putting the infant on their back is a very good practice for that reason. Uh, and, oh, removing a few bedclothes can reduce the, and also, yes, the bunny and the teddy bear and the giraffe and everything you got for the baby. Uh, it should be outside the grip, not inside, until the, the child becomes very mobile. They can turn, they can, like, shift position. Oh, infant <laughs> crying patterns. Crying is, so, okay, I thought, you know, the documentary we watched showed extremely cute babies crying. And you all went, ah, uh, And uh, Emre Bay's thinking, you know, hear that crying for an hour and see what that does to you. Uh, so, and in the documentary, they kind of romanticized a little bit. They said, well, infants know a language, and that language is crying. Well, I mean, yes, it, has commu it gains communicative purpose, not immediately. A newborn, when they cry, are not trying to communicate with you. They're uh, expressing discomfort. The more the parents attend to it in different ways, the more the cry becomes differentiated. The infant learns that crying will lead to an, a reaction, right? But they don't know it when they're first born. The, well, you might, because as a parent, uh, you basically st start reasoning. Well, I just changed the diaper. He's dry. I just fed him. Why is he crying? But he seems like his eyes are red, and he seems like he wants to yawn, but it doesn't form a full yawn. He probably needs help getting to sleep. So you rock him a little bit, for example. And the infant will understand that, you know, that crying is producing a reaction from the mother or the father. All right? So it'll become differentiated later on. Yes? How about something about sleep? This one. The pillow is not going to help the baby, if you think about it, because it is not going to provide a good passageway for the baby. It just complicates it a little bit more. The most natural position for the baby is actually a flat surface. Well, you will probably start using a pillow around two years of age if you're going to use it. But in this position, when they don't really have full mobility, uh, it is not advisable that you start using a pillow for the baby. It is not necessary either. The baby doesn't seek it. Right? And pillow is, I feel like, as a cultural product, too. There are people who sleep without pillows. And then there are people like me who uses four pillows. Uh, I do. I do. Uh, and so um, I don't know what I, I mean. At the, when I wake up, I find three of them on the floor. Uh, but still, I like going to bed with all these pillows. But I feel like it is more of a, it becomes more of a cultural product that we 
become habituated to use rather than something that we really need to go to sleep. Okay. Uh, it creates strong response in adults. And this is not just observational data. There's actually experimental data having adults listen to different sounds. And infant cry is one that elicits immediate reaction. Uh, and it, you don't have to be a parent. Have you ever been on a plane with a crying infant? Unfortunately. unfortunately. But it is unfortunate because, yes, I mean, there's nothing you can do. Uh, and there is sometimes nothing the parent can do either. It is just very stressful for the infant, the infant's inner ear, uh, to be actually flying. And so it happens. Um, and so adults use cry intensity and context to interpret what it means. And the accuracy with which adults diagnose why the infant is crying improves with experience. But it is a very frustrating experience. Um, a friend of mine who last year had the baby said like you want to ask the baby like what and like there, there's nothing that the baby can tell you uh, and you try you do go through the motions you try feeding you try burping you try rocking and you go all over again and try all of those again and the crying continues it subsides it passes this is just the first few months ways to soothe a crying baby Talk softly, play rhythmic sounds, hold on shoulder and rock or walk. Swa what's swaddling? Kujak, kundak, kundak, pardon. Kundak, yes. Uh, it actually suits them. Uh, pa giving a pacifier. Uh, she, pacifier, emzik. It pacifies the baby. Again, uh, maybe something to be edited out. Uh, uh, last year, a friend of mine, a faculty member, had a baby, actually had twins, twin babies. Uh, and, uh, 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 hmm? <laughs> no. <laughs> the mathematician doesn't have any children right now. If she had children, I don't think she would be thinking the way she's thinking about identical <laughs> twins. Uh, this is a different friend, uh, a male colleague, uh, and one day, uh, they are, you know, walking along the road. The babies are in their strollers, and um, the pacifier drops out. And she, he goes and says, "Oh, the tranquilizer has just dropped." What's a tranquilizer? Yatıştırıcı. <laughs> it's the thing that you do to animals, right? <laughs> So uh, it's a Freudian slip, if I ever know one. <laughs> no, it's a pacifier. It pacifies the baby. You can actually get addicted. I was working for the last three years old. It, it can become an object that suits, a transfer object uh, that basically the child clings on to for comfort. Yes. I, I don't know the reason why. I don't know if anybody knows why, but some babies really do not like pacifiers, while others take to it. Yes? Well, but then why do others find it so stimulating? I mean, there are obvious individual differences, but I don't know what makes a baby reject a pacifier and another one like the pacifier. Most babies are suited with a pacifier, if anything. I, I, so if it, not wanting a pacifier could not have an evolutionary purpose. In anything, you are basically using a reflex. Uh, think classical conditioning. Think Miri Hoja, right? Uh, did she not teach cognitive psych last semester to you guys? Yes. So that reflex of sucking suits the baby because it provides food, right? Later on, you basically provide just that a, a stimulus that produces that reflex, and soothing happens as a result of it. Uh, but why won't some babies take pacifiers is a question I can't answer. Riding in carriages, cars, and, or swings. Yes. We could argue about this. So th this is, and we are going to watch uh, in the rest of the documentary, it actually tells us why babies like being in cars. But they do, they fall asleep easier. Be it's because, you know, it kind of mimics the conditions they were in inside the womb, right? It's actually pretty noisy in there with the mom's, I mean, body makes a lot of sounds, 
first of all, there's the heartbeat, the constant thumping of it. And so it kind of is like the motor engine of a car. That's that constant humming. And then inside the womb, baby is basically in that fluid. And it's not like sitting like this. It is actually like moving, right? Tiny movements. And so the car provides that too. Uh, again, I've had friends who say, God damn it, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the husband and the wife go down to the car, put the baby in the car, and they start driving around the block, and the baby falls asleep. Yes, a last minute solution if I ever know one. Uh, but, yes, some people do it. Um, they combine methods and let them cry for a short time if nothing works. Yes, it is something that is going to pass. So what, what are your thoughts about, so there's again, no right answer, no ro wrong answer, but I see a lot of mechanical products that are being uh, produced for babies and parents, where it's like a swing, right? But it is either electrical, yes. I saw a new one, and this one was like a big pillow. It uh, looked like a very primitive horse saddle. Uh, it's a pillow and you strap the infant onto it on its tummy so the infant is basically hugging the pillow and then it starts like wobbling. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Would you think to buy this for yourself and your kid if you had one? Do you have one? No, no? okay. Uh, would you think you shouldn't buy one? What are your thoughts? Buying what? what? Buying these things that swing the baby, rock the baby to sleep. Uh, yes. Are are you uh, doubling? Uh, are, do you have a minor in economics or something? <laughs> <laughs> she approached the subject. It's true. She approached the subject. Uh, this issue from a very nice economic style. Yes, you are not going to make a very long use of it. Uh, you can sell it on eBay. Uh, <laughs> yes? I can't hear you. Would they experiment with the child and if it actually works well? Are there any side effects? Are there any side effects? There are no studies, you're saying. So. It, you, you don't have any research evidence to say if it's effective. First C. Yes, this is the kind of prospective parent I want to see. <laughs> yeah? Yes. I was going to say that I wouldn't buy it because I think, and I wrote it in the first week of the question that you gave us as well, people are so obsessed with doing everything perfectly. And I think it's okay for a baby to cry a little. I mean, they just panic with new parents. Uh, they just panic at everything. They have to. It has to be everything has to be perfect. So that's why they buy a lot of toys, a lot of uh, I don't know uh, things that like they, they 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 provide everything that they can so that the baby just calms down and that does everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they're doing the parenting perfectly. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay for a baby to cry and just let it sleep in a normal position and because we had, that's how we grew up and. There's nothing wrong with this. Oh, that's how we grew up. But in our culture, there's also ayakta sallama. <laughs> Rocking a baby on your legs. So think about it. It helps, obviously. But then, then what, what is the problem? Yes, Yaran. I think as an emotional perspective, uh, the baby and the mother can have this emotional attachment with each other. So I think the solution for babies crying cannot be something mechanical. Yeah. I think it should be a mother or a father. And I can actually imagine myself being jealous of the machine. When my <laughs> <laughs> being jealous of the machine. Yeah, because you know, it can shut down my baby, but I can't hug. So. so you want to be the one who suits your baby, not yeah. the machine. Very nice. <laughs> but sometimes it is impossible, Ipek says. Yes, <laughs> what if it's an overcryer? If you are getting tired of it, do you want to get rid of this cry? Yes. Ah. Maybe buy it and use it occasionally. Occasionally. So not only are we going to <laughs> spend all this money and use it for two months, then we are going to use it occasionally. We can sell it on eBay. And then we can sell yeah. it on eBay. Or, or you pass it to your 
friends, friends baby. baby, cousins, baby. That's usually what <coughs> happens. There really aren't good right or wrong answers. But what we do know is that this, the kind of sleep patterns uh, that are established in early childhood, then they're harder to break. So it's very important and it's very much advised that parents actually establish a good going to bed rhythm with the, as young as possible with their children. And if you keep on this like rocking motion until the child is self-aware, then it's going to be harder to let go of it. So there are children wh whose parents are having, I'm not kidding you, uh, but like spinal, uh, you know, herniated discs and stuff because they're still trying to rock their four-year-olds. Like the, the, that baby, now that, inf not infant, not baby, that young child is too heavy to be rocked on your legs. Right? Where are you going to stop? So the idea is to basically make the child accustomed to the ways of sleeping you will expect later on. Right? And so this is a, it's a trade-off. If a child is colic, cries a lot, uh, cannot be soothed, a solution. And one that should be used occasionally and then sold on eBay. <laughs> but then if your child can be rocked to sleep easily and can sleep without being ro constant rocking, then maybe you don't need this apparatus, right? Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you on Monday.